You can't find everybody, I promise you that. So let's get to our seats. And uh, so first of all, before we investigate the word, I want to say thank you to the worship team. They just did a fantastic job today. Absolutely fantastic. And I, I want to really, I want to point something out to um, Dave and Melanie. You know, they led us in worship today and they picked the songs. What we are going to be talking about today is exactly what they picked out for us to sing about. You know, here at All Nations, in my leadership as a pastor, I do give freedom and flexibility to our worship leaders to pick songs that they think are going to engage with people. But part of that process is that they have to listen to God. And they go to God and say, Lord, what would you like us to sing today that's going to be, uh, that's going to lift you up here in this place and that's going to encourage people to continue to follow you? And I want to tell you, friends, every single song that they picked today was on the same theme. And if you noticed it going through, that's what we want to pay attention in worship about what we're singing, friends. Today, we, we're singing about God's power. Don't be afraid. Even in the midst of the dark storm at times, he's going to come through. It's exactly what we are going to be talking about today in our series. And so I just want to say thank you guys for listening to God in this. And it's important because, and, and what I want to encourage in this too is just that God has something very special in mind for us today. And when we're going to be examining God's word. And so um, I, it, it was a wake up call for me in the midst of my worship to say that God, you're going to do something today for some people that need to absolutely hear this. Uh, we also want to say welcome to everybody that's online too watching. We've got people watching from all over the place, friends. We've got people that are in Africa that watch us on the radio. Yeah, for sure. We've got, we've got people that are in, uh, listening on the radio right now in Espanola that are listening to us, and we want to say welcome you're here. And we've got people down in Florida that uh, we don't feel sorry for them at all. But uh, I wanted to say uh, welcome to I, you're just, I'm, Eileen is joining us today, watching online. Uh, down from Florida. Now, if you don't know her, Eileen, Eileen Mahood, she was one of the matriarchs here at the church. Her husband, Jeremy, was one of the, the original founders of this place. And so um, we just are so thankful you're there. You better be watching, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and all my other Florida friends that are watching, you better tell her, she better be watching. Um, so we're just, but I wanted to shout out, because Eileen, I am just so thrilled that you're down there having a vacation a much needed vacation with some good friends. And so I just, I'm, I'm so happy for you today uh, that you're down there and having a good time. So, so today, God is good. It's a good day to be alive. God has given us life, adventure, purpose. And we are able today to find out a little bit more of that when we examine his word about how we are meant to navigate through life now, if you're new, I just want to do a bit of a recap of what we're, where we've been for the last little bit. And we are in a series, series in the book of Philippians. Now, the Philippians book, it was written by the Apostle Paul, and it's one of the books of the Bible. There's 66 books that are contained in the Bible, and they're all put together because it gives us a true look of God's, how he wanted things to begin, and his overarching redemption of humanity, right from the beginning of Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's a big picture of God's love and his redemption plan for us. And so Philippians is part of that, written by the Apostle Paul. Now, the interesting thing that puts context into what we are talking about today, and it's important to know from reading the book of Philippians, is that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter when he was in jail. And we talked about this a little bit, and we won't go into full details, but I want for those of you that are new to understand the context of what you're reading, because it sure does give it more weight when we actually read it. He's in jail, and not jail like today. He's in a dungeon, chained to a wall, damp, dark. They don't feed you. You have to figure out how you're going to get people to come and bring you food in jail. He's starving. The conditions are horrible rarely seeing sunlight. Not a place where he would find a lot of joy in his environment. So today, when we think about the context of what we're going to be hearing about with Paul, I want to warn you about what we're going to talk about today. And it's, I want to call it Advanced Christianity 101. And the reason for that is this is that the concepts we're going to talk, talk about today really are at the core 
of our thoughts about the intersection of God and bad things that happen to good people or his people. Now, perhaps you've ever you've heard a thought like this expressed, or maybe you've even thought this yourself. So God is good. Something bad happened to me. Therefore, God has to make something good happen to justify the claim that God is good. I then should be happy about the bad thing that happened since it's being transformed into something good. Do you follow along with the thought process? Have you maybe thought those thoughts at times in your life? I want to go through it again because it's going to set the table for what we're going to be talking about. Our thought process at times, or our, I want to say that, that thoughts that have been expressed to me as a pastor, go a bit like this. I understand that God is supposed to be good. Something bad happened to me. Therefore, God has to make something good happen to justify the claim that God is good. I then should be happy about the bad thing that happened since it, has been, it, since it is being transformed into something good. So with that thought in mind, let's read from Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 21, and this is what it says. This is Paul in prison, writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ in Philippians, in Philippi. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, but not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains, while I'm in jail. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether for false motives or true, Christ is preaching, because of this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What a statement to make. So, the context. He's in jail. Not pleasant. Picture it in your mind. Dark, damp, stone, no bed, little food, no sun chained to a wall. And in this environment, he penned those words. So how? How is he not able to succumb to the despair or be discouraged about this environment that he finds him in? And here's how it is, friends. When I read this passage, he has a definition of life that enables him to face anything. How does he get not succumb to despair? He has defined his life, and he has a definition of life that enables him to face anything. So, how do you define life? What are you living for? Are you living for yourself? What's the most important thing in life to you? What is the thing that makes life worth living regardless of what happens? And do you have that? See, most of us, I don't, we go through life, we don't really ask that question, do we? What's life about? Most of us don't ever ask that question until something actually really terrible happens. Well, Paul's life, something terrible really did happen. You see, Paul is saying here, when you read this passage, the overall theme, not only of this passage, but the entire book, he's saying this, don't worry I'm not discouraged. I might even die. It's very possible, but that which I live for, it's not touched by the circumstance that I am in. What a perspective to have about challenging situations that he faced in his life. 
So remember, he's in prison, right? But the position of his life and the perspective that he has is that he, what he lives for is not touched by this terrible circumstance. So I read this scripture today, and I couldn't help but think of two things that are happening in the midst of our congregation today, the ones that I'm aware of. We, we had, two weeks ago, we were informed that Ralph and Jessica Linton, they were a couple, they were involved in a serious car accident. She broke her back, her chest, her leg, her foot. Serious, serious injuries. And that now she's down in self with, with these injuries and facing this. I'm also reminded, just in this moment, of another friend by the name of Christy Smith. She's our painter, resident painter, resident painter at in Killarney. And her husband is facing some serious health challenges as well with a stroke that took place. Now, I asked her permission to share this with you today in the, in the hopes that we would remember them in prayer throughout the week as we pray that, that there would become a... a quicker recovery for both of them in the situation that is taking place. Why it brought to my mind. Terrible things happening to some great God-fearing people. Just like a terrible thing that happened to the author of the letter, Apostle Paul. Unfairly locked up, torturous prison in chains, chained to a wall. And yet he proclaims this, and he quotes it, I will continue to rejoice. And one of the perspectives that he has as we are reading that passage in prison is that he, it seems like that the reason for his rejoicing is that something good is coming out of it. Here's what he says, and I'm going to just remind us again of a bit of it, the portion of the scripture. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have been confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I want to break this down a little bit because this is what I think I understand him to be saying. Everything that has happened to me has helped to spread the good news of Jesus. And so I rejoice. So the bad things that just happened, it's justified by the good that occurred no matter how much suffering he has endured. Would that be a fair understanding of what we just read? You see, and I think, I think when I read that and I understand what Paul is saying, I think it raises a lot of questions that are implicated because of that thought process. Here would be three of them that I thought of. So did God make or allow Paul to be in this dark place under chains to make something good happen in someone else's life? Did God make or allow Paul to be in this dark place under chains to make something good happen in someone else's life? The second one I thought about, is that how God operates? So then, do the bad things that have happened in my own life must always be justified since something good has happened to me or someone else? Is that how I am meant to process and operate in a broken world that we live in today? And the third thing I asked myself as I read that and what Paul was saying in there is this. Is God, is good out of bad always the outcome of bad things? Good out of bad, always the outcome of bad things. Are some things just bad? Does there always have to be a justification for bad things happening in a Christian worldview? Does there have to be a reason? So I want to read a couple two, uh, another couple passages that, that reinforce a little bit of what Paul is saying here to illuminate these questions more in our spirits and in our minds. And one's in Romans chapter 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. A lot of us know that passage or we've heard that before. Here's one you might not have heard. Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me. And this is talking about one of the characters in, in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So this thought process of Paul that he has a bit of in the book of Philipp Philippians, these scriptures that I just introduced you to as well, pierce at the heart 
of what we believe about God that is reinforced in the Bible. God is sovereign. The big, big word. But I'm going to try and break it down for us so we understand what that word is and what it encompasses. God is sovereign essentially means this, that he has the power, the wisdom, the authority to do anything he chooses within his creation. Whether or not he actually exerts that level of control in any given circumstance is actually a completely different question. So all that happens must have at least been allowed by him, if not directly caused by him. I want to read that again. It's, it's a profound thought because this is the essential of what we believe as Christians about God. He is omnipotent, all power, which is all-powerful. He's omniscient. He knows all things, and he is om- omnipresent. He is with us at all times. God is sovereign. He has the power, wisdom, and authority to do anything he chooses within his creation. So this is where I'm talking about being advanced Christianity 101. We struggle through this question. If God is good and has the power to control all things, why do bad things happen? We've all heard this question being asked. We have asked this question. If God is good and has the power to control all things, why do bad things happen? Now, I say this is an advanced Christian question, advanced Christianity 101, because if you don't believe in God, you don't think there's anything out there, then there's really nothing to complain about. Bad things happen, good things happen. It's all out of control. I certainly don't like those bad things that happen, but really, they're going to happen. And good things are going to happen, so who cares? Right? So the, this advanced Christianity 101 is us wrestling through this Understanding that God is sovereign, omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, knows all things, always there, omnipresent. Now, we are not going to be able today to fully answer this question. Why do bad things happen to good people if God is good? And this has been debated for thousands of years by people way smarter than any of us here in this place. But what I think we want to do today in our time is that I think we can have a different tool and perspective to achieve that same attitude that Paul has for his life. I continue to rejoice. And that's our theme in this passage, in this chapter of book of the Bible, right? Finding joy. I continue to rejoice. Don't you want to have that attitude when you're finding yourself in bad place? but you could still be in in your soul itself with an attitude of rejoicing. So, some perspectives that I think Paul is expressing in this passage that I think are going to help us when we are wrestling with these bad things that happen to us when there's a good God. Firstly, Paul's perspective is that his suffering, his chains, has helped to spread the gospel, and he made that very clear to us. He's looking past his immediate circumstance and seeing that in the midst of the suffering, good is happening and purpose is being accomplished. And I think the point and the perspective of it is this. Paul's perspective is that he doesn't live only for himself. He doesn't live only for himself. Now, it was interesting as I was doing this. Can you put up the next slide? I want to see if I actually found a slide that's going to reinforce this. No, it was just a scripture? You know, okay, so I asked a question, and, and I want you to think about this for a minute. Paul's perspective is he's not only living for himself. So I went online, and, and sometimes I use pictures here to reinforce, you know, a concept, not necessarily directly, but, but anything. So I, I was looking online, and I was searching for images, and I said, in my search, I said, um, Living for, you know, living outside of yourself. I could not find one single picture, one single book, one website that even referred the idea casually that 
perhaps it's not a good idea to just live for self. Do you know how many websites and pictures I found online that, that said, you know, how to live for yourself only? Self-love, right? Now, now friends, we're, we're, it's a balance, right? I'm not suggesting that you only live for others to the detriment of yourself fully. I'm not saying that. Um, and, and I don't think God is telling us that as well. But, but wow, the pendulum. I'm talking like there was nothing, zero. It was all about live for yourself only. Why do I want to bring this up? Because I've been thinking about this all morning and God wants you to hear this today. You think if living for yourself only, how many relationships that you've had in your life where you've lived for yourself only have been successful? Zero. I promise you it's zero. I want you to think about that as we're continuing on, even with your relationship with Jesus Christ. He is all in on you. He went to the cross to die for your sins so you would have a relationship with, it, with him. That's the relationship that Jesus, that God wants with you. How much are you invested in the relationship? So, viewing life in Paul's perspective is this that he lives beyond his own self. It says this in Ephesians 1.11 as an attitude that we are all meant to have. And this is from the message. It's a uh, Bible that's a, um, a paraphrase of, of the passage. And, it, and this is what it says. The Bible says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are, what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us and his designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. What an amazing perspective. Long before we first heard of Christ and we got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us, designs on us for glorious living, part of the purpose of him working out in everything and everyone. See, Paul viewed his circumstance not for the circumstance itself, but he realized that life wasn't just about him being comfortable. He could have viewed life from the bad side of the situation. And any of us here in this room would say, yeah, I understand why you're complaining right now. You're imprisoned in a cold, damp cell with no bed and no sun and starving. He had every reason to complain about his circumstance, and he never did. He chose to see the situation from the opportunity that opened up because of the situation of the situation to fulfill the ultimate purpose for his life. This opened up, which fulfilled what truly he believed his life was about. Not just himself. So when I read this and I try to apply this to my own life, I don't think it means that we aren't to have questions or doubts about things that happen that seem really dark. I don't think it means that at all. We continually, through Paul's example, want to taste and bring us back to and remember what we are ultimately living for. What is the promises that God makes for us? Because in the light of that, the present troubles diminish. See, we were made by God for God. And until we all understand that, life will never make sense. So how? How do we embody this attitude that Paul has when facing challenges? We live for a different perspective on life, that life is not fully about us. God is making sure, making sure that life isn't all about my happiness, about me looking out, not in, looking out to God, not in to ourselves. So the second part of this verse that's going to take a bit of thought with all of us here, so stay with me, is that in processing challenging moments and God's sovereignty, right? God is good. He has power to do everything. He knows everything. He knows his purpose and plans. And 
in processing these moments that we have that are dark with God's sovereignty, we accept that we can never reconcile everything. We accept that we can never reconcile everything. This bad thing happened, God is good. Why? Not sure. So here's what Paul says in this, in this prison cell. And I need you to follow along with my thought process. Sometimes it's a little crazy, but I think together it's going to make sense of what I'm going to say afterwards. Okay. So here's Paul. I'm in, and this is my thought process of what he's saying. I'm in prison, but it has served the purpose of exposing more to Christ, and more Christians are becoming confident in sharing Christ. That's good, isn't it? Right? We would all admit, yes, I could see how that would be good. Now, if the verses ended there, as I said before, we could fully conclude that Paul is saying we should rejoice and be prepared for any and all bad things that happen, knowing that you are a chess piece in God's great sovereign plan in the world. You might think that could be the conclusion that you could come to. But here's the next part of this verse that I think gives us context in revealing where we should really land our thoughts. Philippians 1.15. It's true that some preach out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. Now, so when we read this whole passage, the beginning of the passage, him talking about being in chains and him coming to the conclusion that, you know, there's some good things that are happening as a result of it. Sure, it created a lot of questions for us that we wanted to examine. And if we landed right there, we didn't read the rest of the context of the Bible, then we could come to that conclusion that, that, Bad things can be justified about God being good by the positive outcome of inspiring Christians. But I want you to re read in between the lines here because this verse by itself, that one that's up here, it, it's strange for him to say this if that's what his full conclusion is. It just pops in here. It doesn't follow the same sort of thought process that we were just originally talking about. Now, listen to this. He says that there's this good thing that happened, but, but also listen what else he says. He's also inspired bad actors that were actively making his prison experience worse and doing so for selfish ambition, envy, and rivalry. So, here's what I want to, to, you to think about. Can we still justify God as good about the dark situation when clearly... Also, worse things are happening as a result of the situation. Here's what I want you to think about, the Paul, what he, I think Paul is trying to suggest when he is wrestling through this. And let me sum it up again, too, because it's confused in my mind right now. Right? So Paul is saying here, I'm in prison. This good thing has happened. I've actually, which is good. Okay, so, sorry, I'm in prison. That's bad. But I can justify this bad thing by saying, well, some good things are happening and it's accomplishing God's will, so therefore God is good, right? We're following that. Then he goes on to say this. He says, okay, I've inspired these good things to happen. People are going out and sharing the gospel, but I've also inspired bad things to happen, right? There's other people that are out there now and they're making my experience in prison, the bad thing, worse because of me inspiring people to do something. Are you following through with, it, with what's being said there? It's an interesting point to me, right? Because I think this is what Paul is suggesting. When he says this, I don't have the significant knowledge power to make a justification for God when bad things happen to good people. I do not have the significant knowledge or power to make a justification for God when bad things happen to good people. I want to give you a story about a real life story that I think really sums up this point about bad things happening to good people and us understanding God's purpose in this. One of my closest friends in Edmonton, he pastors a, long, a large church in Edmonton that we pastored together for a long time. I was in 15 years of ministry. I was with my friend. Uh, at this church. Now he's going on to be the senior pastor there. He's got a wonderful wife and two wonderful kids. When you look at his situation in life, you might conclude that he is blessed. 
that he is a Christian and that God's goodness is evident in his life. But friends, it wasn't always like that. 25 years ago, before I even knew him, my friend and his newly married wife, they'd been married for about approximately a year. They were driving on the Coquihalla from Vancouver to Kelowna. They hit a patch of ice, lost control of the vehicle with him ending up holding his dying wife in his arms as she pa passed away. So he was a great friend at, at the time, you know, when I was back there. And so, you know, we had freedom to ask each other questions and, and challenging questions. And I asked him this one time, if you had God's power, would you change this terrible, dark outcome that you might conclude was awful? You might say, God, you are not good because look at this horrible thing. I was at the pinnacle of, of moving forward into my life and it was going to be beautiful and I loved my, my wife and we were going to, God, you are not good. So I ask, if you have God's power, would you change this terrible, dark circumstance that some might say God is not in control and God is not good? He's just, he's up there. If there is a God, he's just up there letting everybody, everything just happen the way it's going to happen. So if you could do this thing, go back and fix this thing that could be concluded as bad under these conditions, your previous life would be back alive. You had the power to do that. And therefore, the potential of this grand life is ahead of you. The trajectory of your life would be different than it is today, but would be similar to the cir curtain circumstances of your life now. We might look back then, say he's, he, he goes back, changes that circumstance, and now is, is married with this woman, with two kids. We'll just say the circumstances are the same. But... If you were to do that, you would not have a relationship with your current wife and your children that are today would not exist, for they are the equal combination of the DNA of your current wife and you. Your current kids would not exist. Perhaps other kids would. So, if you had the power to change your current income, would you? I want to ask that of all of us today. If you had the power to change, if you had the same circumstance as my friend, bad thing happened, you know, at the time, God is not good. This bad thing is here, but good happened. He has another wife, and he has two wonderful kids, right? We might look at that and say, God blessed him. You had the power to go back there and do this, undo this bad thing. But in doing that, you also undo this good thing that you have. Would you do it? Could you do it? Could you do it? So you might be tempted to say, well, God, you made good happen out of this bad circumstance. Look at his knife now. But how could you possibly determine? How could you possibly determine that the circumstance that you've now created undoing this good thing to now make it bad because you no longer have these kids anymore, how could you possibly determine that's the right thing to do? The point is this, friends. The point Paul is trying to make in that passage, and I think I'm trying to make today is, you don't have infinite knowledge. You don't have infinite power. You don't have the moral fortitude. God is good all the time. We are not good all the time. We are sinners. They're saved by grace. You don't have the moral fortitude to possibly make a decision about this and, and come to a judgment on God about whether he is good or not or whether this bad situation that happened to good people can be justified by something good happening out of it later on. You can't do it. You don't have the mechanism to be able to do this. And see, that's what Paul is trying to say in this passage. I'm in prison. It may seem like it's bad, but God is doing something good. But even in God doing something good, me inspiring something, something good is happening, but something also bad is happening. I don't think that's what he wants us to wrestle with. We can't know. And we can't make a judgment on God about bad things and, and him being a good God. It just It's out of our power to do that. You see, and that's what I think 
the conclusion Paul comes to, and he wants to inspire us and our thoughts to do. And it's in verse 20. And it says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will, all, I, will be, be, I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Here's what he's saying, friends, and he wants us to accept this. He's saying this about his life. I'm Christ's messenger. Dead, I'm his prize. Life versus more life, I can't lose. He's in the center of God's will for his life. And that's his perspective in going through this. And he's saying to all of us, rather than us focusing on our dark circumstances and trying to understand the will of God and the mind of God and justifying that God is good, he's encouraging all of us, live in the middle of God's will for your life because you will be alive. And even in the circumstance, the dark circumstance that takes place, he's saying here, even if I were to die, and it's very possible it could happen in prison, I'm still going to be in a better place. It's win-win is what he's trying to encourage us in, friends. Alive, I'm fully surrendered to Jesus as Lord as I follow him fully and, and acknowledge him. He is accomplishing his plan for me. And in death, I'm going to be with him. I'm going to ask the team to make their way up here as we just are concluding what we're thinking about here. You see, I want to reinforce, reinforce what Paul, I think, is saying, what I want us to understand. See, he's saying, I don't have the proper knowledge power to justify the outcome he's in. He's saying, I can't, you know, this good thing is happening, but I, I'm not God. I can't fully understand this. It's a mystery. But... Paul is saying here, if my perspective about life is following God in Christ and not the highest degree of comfort in myself, I can use that as a mechanism to overcome these dark obstacles and situations that are happening in my life. That's what Paul wants us, and that's how we are going to be able to find joy. So here's Paul. He's resting in this beautiful mystery. Bad things happening in this world, but he holds on to the promise that God is in control. God is love. And then his primary reason for Paul to exist is to love Jesus and to surrender his life and heart fully to God. See, that's how we, friends, can make a buffer, create a buffer against the darkness, the bad things, the, the situations that we find ourselves in. That's how we buffer against it. And that's how we find joy. That's how we continue to rejoice in bad circumstances and situations. So let's wrap it up. God's sovereignty, right? God's in control. It's a natural, that word God's sovereignty, it's a natural consequence of his omniscience, his omnipotence, and his omnipresence. And send, friends, we can still leave this place and still firmly believe and share that God is good and wants to see humanity return to the paradise on earth that he initially created, the paradise, the intimate paradise of having a relationship with him fully and do so with authority. He's coming again. And he wants you. He doesn't want a relationship with you that says, God, I'm going to give you only 10%. He wants your whole heart. He's given you his whole heart. And he wants that. So at the same time, we can hold on to this. And at the same time, we know that the Bible also describes God as offering us, humanity, choices. He holds us at times, in Deuteronomy, he holds us personally responsible for our sins, the sins that we've created, the damage and the dark outcomes that we've done to ourselves. He holds us responsible for those. He also says, you know, and, and personally responsible for our sins, the choices that we make in that. He also says in Numbers that he is at times unhappy with our actions at times. See, friends, the fact that sin exists at all, that it means that not all things are direct actions of God because God himself is holy. Right? God gives us some freedom for us to make some really profound mistakes and find us in situations that are bad outcomes. 
So, wrapping it up. Bad things happen to people. God is good and has a sovereign plan for all of us. And he's continually at work, continually at work in creating a restored relationship with him and a return to this paradise that he originally had created. Good things can happen from bad situations. But that doesn't need to be a justification for believing in a good God. We rest in the mystery of this as we fully surrender and live out for Christ that gives us the power to find joy even in our darkest hour. Amen? amen. All God's people said amen. Oh, yeah. amen. amen. Brad, please uh, 